Good afternoon, folks. Great to be back again. I'm Rajiv, a partner on top five early stage VC fund focused in India with close to 100 startups and multiple unicorns. Mike's speciality is that he has made money in markets moving down, recessionary and volatile environments, which make this conversation all the more relevant, particularly given what's happening in the macro circumstances right now. Mike is a founder of Element Macro Research, an independent investment research firm serving a wide range of clients, including hedge funds, mutual funds, financial advisors, family offices, and individual investors. Prior to this, he has worked with K2 Advisors, Paloma Partners, and NICE, and also ran a trading firm known as Delta Profit Trader. I'm really looking forward to this uh, conversation, Mike. So I'm going to ask um, you to take the center stage for about 30 minutes. Uh, folks, you don't need to make any notes because we are happy to make this conversation available after. Um, after this, we'll move to the Q&A. Please type your questions in chat. We'll definitely get to them. I look forward to a productive 45 to 60 minutes. So without further ado, Mike, over to you. Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, thank you, everyone, for having me here. Uh, it's a pleasure um, sharing a little bit about, you know, how we go about viewing the world, um, but more importantly, really how, um, you know, different time horizons uh, factor into investor decision making. And so what I want to do today is talk a little bit about how markets tend to behave over different time horizons. Um, how certain strategies, particularly ours, um, sort of fits within that. Um, but it goes beyond that as well, because it really, um, whether you're operating in private markets or venture capital or public markets, um, you know, I really do believe that it is extremely relevant. Um, so, uh, so let's just go ahead and get started with the presentation here. <clears throat> so, you know, I want to start with. Uh, it might seem like a bit of a silly question, but um, it is, do fundamentals matter, right? We, we hear a lot about investing, um, you know, looking at earnings growth or, um, you know, economic growth and whatever it might be, uh, but do they actually matter to price movements as it pertains to, say, the public markets? Um, yep, next slide. <clears throat> so just to give you an idea, um, what I want to do is share a quote from Benjamin Graham, and a lot of you, I'm sure, have heard of Benjamin Graham. He's kind of known as the godfather of value investing. He he was sort of a tutor to uh, Warren Buffett, and uh, this was a testimony he gave to Congress back in 1955. And uh, you know, I've I've made some highlights here um, on some of the things that he said, but basically, he was asked, you know, what is it that causes a market or a price of an asset to, you know, experience these wild fluctuations. And basically, you know, being a value investor, you would expect him to say something to the tune of, you know, improving business fund fundamentals. Uh, but actually his response to Congress was that um, that's one of the great mysteries of our business, uh, both to him and everybody else. And, you know, he goes on to say a few other things, but really he's, he kind of wraps up by saying that his studies have led to the conclusion that sentiment alone, not supported by any visible change in value, can produce these really wild swings. So, um, you know, when it comes to do fundamentals matter that, you know, that really sort of should, should give us some thought. Um, next slide, please. So... <clears throat> When it comes to investing, there's a lot of different ways of going about things, right? And whether it's quant type strategies or discretionary technical analysis or fundamental value investing, um, really this all boils down into two categories, right? Um, there's technical analysis and there's fundamental analysis. And you know, even the the quantitative funds that are out there, like your trend followers or say your DE Shaw or you know Citadels of the world, they those actually fall into the technical analysis bucket because really quantitative strategies are nothing more than programmed price behavior or you know looking at volume and volatility and price behavior or trends. And so really quantitative is just, a systematic way of going about technical analysis. And so when we look at this, um, this wasn't something that I came up with. I found this from, from another gentleman, but he called this the arrogance ignorance continuum. And so on the pure technical analysis side, there's a few things that go into that, right? Only price matters. 
Um, it assumes that you know nothing about your investment, right? You hear a lot of technicians say, I don't care what the name of the company is. I don't care what it does. Uh, I just want to know the price of its stock and how it's behaving. Um, this assumes that the market is always right. Wherever the price is moving, the market is correct. So you're following that. And this would actually, you know, be the point of maximum ignorance, right? You, you just claim, I, I don't know anything. I'm just following price. On the other side of the spectrum, you have the pure fundamental analysis. And here, the investor believes that only the fundamentals matter, right? Earnings, revenue, uh, balance sheets, things of that nature. Uh, it assumes that the investor knows everything about that investment. And it also assumes that you're smarter than the market, right? When you buy something, you're taking the view that you are correct on its value and the market is incorrect. When you sell it, it's the other way around. And this could be the point of maximum arrogance, right? You'll hear a lot of um, you know, unfortunate stories about investors that experience extremely large losses because you know they keep doubling down, they keep buying more as the price falls because they just believe, you know, I'm right, the market's wrong. And while these two buckets really have a, a really um, strong battle as to what the correct way is to go about things. Uh, our view is that it's probably best to be somewhere in the middle. Uh, next slide, please. So while we do here at Strom Capital Management, while we do incorporate technicals into our process, um, I do want to point out something that I do believe that price at times can be a liar as well. And so these are just a couple of clever quotes from some legendary investors and economists who talk about this idea where price can be uh, a liar. Uh, you know, John Maynard Keynes said that the market can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent, right? That's a popular one we've all heard. George Soros actually says that he starts with the belief that market prices are actually always wrong because they're a, a biased view of the future. So while we do believe that technicals do have a place in your process, um, it, it's, we shouldn't just be blindly following them. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so as I mentioned at the outset, really there are three distinct timeframes um, for investors. And again, this can, this can pertain to public markets, private markets, whatever you're looking at. And uh, what I wanna do is talk about the behavior of markets on the, you know, across these different time frames. So when we start with the short term, what we see there is there's a very strong tendency of mean reversion. So that's, you know, price is up today, it's down tomorrow. It's up two days in a row, it's down the third day. There's a very few, there are very few instances where price kind of goes up, 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 you know, several days, um, you know, would be a, a trend or a follow through. A lot of this trading tends to be algorithmic or technical, right? The quant studies. Um, it tends to be emotional when investors are re reacting to, say, earnings releases or news events. You know, we, we hear today about the debt ceiling in the U.S. And, you know, is that leading to a potential emotional reaction from investors? And in the short term, those emotional and technical movements do tend to create dislocations from the fundamental drivers. But when we move to the medium term, what we actually see there is we move away from mean reversion and we actually see strong trending uh, asset prices. So, you know, if you look anywhere from, say, a three month to, you know, a year or two year time frame, you'll really start to see price trends. And you can pull up a price chart of really anything, whether it's interest rates or uh, uh, currencies or stock markets or bonds. Um, they do tend to have very strong trends. You know, there's a reason that uh, a lot of traders do follow the same sort of uh, moving averages, right? Those are just a very basic representation of a trend. Um, so we see strong trends in the medium term. We see fundamentals becoming more important. We actually see that those dis dislocations that were created from the short-term volatility tend to get resolved and start to line up more with the fundamentals. Um, and one of the primary drivers here uh, of the medium term is the, is monetary policy, and the, you know really that ties in with the business cycle. As economic growth is very strong, 
and um, inflation starts to pick up, obviously central banks tend to tighten policy. And the thing with that, and the reason why asset prices tend to trend is because central bankers aren't quick to pivot policy, right? Outside of a major crisis um, where it creates a sudden response like we saw with the COVID crisis here in the United States, um, they really don't change quickly. They kind of they tr they try to forecast their their moves to the market to not surprise the market, and they they're very slow in moving their trajectory from easing to tightening and so on. So then we move back into the long term, and here it's interesting enough is the long term actually looks very similar to the short term um, in several respects, where we actually see strong mean reversion. And yes, fundamentals do play a part here, but also but emotions do as well. And we do see a lot of dislocations start to form in, in the long term. Um, and it's tend to be driven by fiscal policy, um, you know, how the broader economy is performing over the long term, demographics, um, what's the, the working age population look like. Um, but as I was saying, you know, in terms of the mean reversion and how the fundamental and emotional and dislocations, you know, that sounds very similar to the to the short term. You know, I guess the best example would be you know, say the, the United States with the technology bubble in 2000, right? Now that was something where we saw an extreme dislocation from fundamental values. And that was a very emotional time. Investors just had a sense that they didn't want to miss out on these go-go prices of technology stocks. Well, that was very emotional, but it created a major dislocation from fundamentals. And then we all of a sudden, when the sort of, it all broke apart, we saw that strong mean reversion back down to those fundamental values. <clears throat> so as you can see, as we move throughout the cycle, markets then have very different behaviors and they're driven by different things. And so when you approach investments, again, whether it's in the private markets, you know, if you see sort of short-term volatility or dislocations and you're evaluating a private investment that, you know, you see a very strong structural trend, well, that you could use that to your advantage, um, you know, if there's a short-term dislocation there. Next slide, please. So 20%, you're probably wondering what, what the heck does 20% mean? So there's a little bit of literature out there, and actually this, um, this is also written in the Chartered Market Technician literature, that markets tend to trend only 20% of the time. Now, that's pretty astounding if you think about it, because a lot of investors feel like, especially in the public markets, like they always need to be involved. They always need to be doing things. But the reality is markets are only trending 20% of the time. And the rest of the time, they're just kind of wandering sideways, doing nothing. And so, you know, our view here at Strom Capital Management is when prices are sort of trending sideways, doing nothing, you leave, you leave yourself, you know, susceptible to a lot of shock or headline risk. Right. If there's not a strong trend, then you're just sitting with positions that, you know, they're not doing anything for your money. And really the goal in the markets is to have your money, you know, generate as best returns as possible. So next slide, please. So to give you a sense of this, uh, you know, we, we've done a bit of studies on our own, but, um, you know, the, the best way to just give this visually is um, this chart of the S&P 500. And this is from a presentation I actually gave back at the end of 2019. And, um, you know, if we look at this five-year time frame on the S&P 500, we actually see that from late 2014 to late 2016, there's a lot of volatility back and forth, but little progress. And then from early 2018 to the end of 2019, again, a lot of back and forth with very little progress. And so what that left is really only 2017 was the one year where the vast majority of gains were generated. And so if we think to that 20% rule, we, we're back to one year out of that five-year period was really where the bulk of, of the trend or the price, price advancement occurred. So this is just a, a perfect example, and you can find lots of other examples that are out there as well. Next slide, please. And just to, to go back again to those to those time horizons that I talked about, the short, medium, and long, um, here's a perfect representation. Now, this is the stock to bond ratio. And the reason I chose this is because um, this is a relative performance between the S&P 500 and the U.S. 
um, a U.S. bond market index. And the reason I chose this is because uh, if you look at a long-term chart of just a stock market, it's going to go from the lower left to the upper right over time because the economy grows over time, earnings grow over time. And so the companies that represent that economic growth will naturally you know, drift higher over time as well. But what this shows is so you can sort of see the behavior of markets across those different time horizons. So, you know, in the short term, you kind of see those, those little squiggly up and down, up and down, up and down. And that's your mean reversion, right? That's a lot of noise and back and forth and, and technical trading. But then if you look at, say, like 2000 to 2002, or even 2003 to 2007, those are your intermediate term or medium term where the trends really take hold and fundamentals start to be realized and investors come around to what's actually going on. And then in the long term, well, you see sort of that mean reversion, right? You go way up high, stocks are, are extremely in favor over bonds, and then that sort of reverses. And so that kind of gives you your, your mean reversion over the long term. So you can just, you know, this just gives you a sense of that ebb and flow over the different time horizons, um, for, you know, in terms of the relative performance of different asset classes. Next slide, please. So... As I mentioned, you know, we, we have that arrogance, ignorance continuum um, and how probably being somewhere in the middle is the best. And so this is the framework that we've come up with here at Strom Capital Management. Um, and this is how we really form our investment views. And if you if you look at this, it's basically a combination, right? It's we're taking both the combination of fundamental and technical, right? That uh, arrogance, ignorance continuum. But then we're also blending in those different time horizons. So we're really trying to generate a holistic view of how to go about the world. And so if you look at these buckets, there's valuation, liquidity, sentiment, and technicals. Now, valuation, liquidity, those tend to be your slowly, slower moving drivers, right? Valuation, the dot-com bubble, or the 2008 financial crisis, you get those extremes. Those aren't great for timing, but it tells you your overall opportunity set. You know, are things really attractive on a value or are they you know, kind of risky on a value basis? Liquidity, again, central banks tend to move along with the business cycle. So those aren't really fast moving things. Then you move to, to uh, sentiment and technicals, right? That's sort of your shorter term uh, time horizon where you can look at market positioning, you can look at sentiment surveys, you can look at price action or volatility indicators. And so really what we try to do is blend these all in together to form our view. And the reason we do that is, you know, we're, even though we're macro investors um, or traders, I should say, um, I wouldn't say that we're macro forecasters. And there's a very important difference there because we're not trying to predict what you know, GDP will be here in the United States by the end of this year, or we're not trying to say that inflation will be 3% by the end of 2023, or we're not trying to, you know, predict what the inflation rate in China will be. Instead, we're really, our approach to markets is we're just trying to observe what's going on around the world, kind of absorbing all the fundamental information and then also looking at what market participants are doing, how they're positioned, what their sentiment is. And, you know, and, and liquidity is uh, in our view, and it's, um, you know, if you've heard of the legendary Stan Druckenmiller, um, that's his view as well, is that liquidity is a primary driver of asset prices, not earnings, not economic growth, but liquidity. And so, um, you know, here's a couple more quotes here at the bottom of this page from uh, some other legendary trader uh, investors, Howard Marks of Oak Tree. You know, he swears off forecasting because he doesn't think anybody can do it. Um, George Soros actually uh, thinks that it's a, a foolish belief that anyone can actually predict what's going to happen in the markets. And so this is our framework of how we try to formulate our different scenarios. And then again, the technicals kind of inform us of what one of those scenarios is starting to play out. Um, and so here's another quote from another macro trader, Paul Tudor Jones. And I think it's really relevant to today because you hear a lot of people talk about the similarities to the 70s and 80s here in the United States with high levels of inflation um, and, and the volatility that we've been experiencing the last few years. Um, and what Paul Tudor Jones had to say was that 
you know, this period, a lot of the successful macro guys, it was because um, the amount of fundamental information was so limited and the volatility, volatility was so extreme, excuse me, that one had to be a technician, right? You had to fold in that technical analysis to your process. Now, today, we obviously don't have a shortage of, of fundamental information. We have an abundance of fundamental information, but I would argue that it almost creates a similar dynamic, right? Um, back then, the limited amount of fundamental information made it difficult to make a decision. Today, we almost have too much information, right? You hear about sort of decision paralysis because you have so much information that you feel like you need the perfect set of circumstances before making a decision. And so, you know, I think this is very apt to where we are today and why we think that, you know, our particular approach is, is really useful in, in the environment that we foresee for the next several years. So what exactly is our approach, right? And what I want to talk about today is, um, aside from those different time horizons, we're kind of moving now into short convexity versus long convexity. And so if we go to the next slide here, I'll, I'll try to explain short convexity in a nutshell, right? So this is the proverbial picking up pennies or nickels in front of a steamroller, right? And this is what most of your traditional asset classes are. You think about equities, you think about bonds, corporate debt, um, a lot of these shorting volatility, a lot of these strategies, you know, are you, ex you basically accept small returns with the occasional tail risk or occasional blow up risk, right? And so a lot of the portfolios out there today, while they look like they're diversified across asset classes, in reality, a lot of them are very short convexity. Um, you know, if you look at their return distributions. Next slide, please. Now, on the other hand, a long convexity mindset is basically one where you're taking, um, you know, you're, you're okay with sort of those back and forth small fluctuations, but what you're looking for are those tail events. And why I think this is so relevant is we constantly hear of these, you know, once in a lifetime events, but, you know, those seem to be happening three, four times a year. Um, and so, you know, what, what reality shows us is that we don't live in a normal distribution type of world, right? We actually live in a world where the tails are much fatter in the distribution, where these low probability events happen much more often. And so, you know, here's another set of quotes here from George Soros, Jack Schwager, if any of you have heard the Market Wizard series, and Paul Tudor Jones again. And this is really the approach right, is, is we're not necessarily trying to um, follow along with what everyone else is doing, because where the most powerful turns come in the market, mo most powerful trends, is when the obvious all of a sudden becomes the unexpected, right, as George Shurl says. You, you discount the obvious, because everyone already knows that, everyone's already positioned that way, and you bet on the unexpected, or when people are forced to reevaluate re their, their, their biases and they have to suddenly reposition their portfolios. And we'll actually get into some of those that we see today. Um, and then Paul Tudor Jones talks about it again with his philosophy that, you know, by having this long convexity mindset, you know, going for those big tail events, um, you can actually be wrong a lot, right? You're basically taking small wins, small losses, making kind of little bit of progress here and there. But when you're right, you're really right. And so if you have a five to one, right, say uh, reward to risk ratio, you can actually be wrong 80% of the time and still make money. And so that's, you know, I think that's really profound if you think about how most people approach their investments is that they think about diversifying and sort of writing the trend. And then all of a sudden, you know, COVID crisis hits and everything becomes correlated. Um, and so what we try to do is we try to find those sort of tail events across different asset classes, and they can be right tail, right? Positive risk assets or negative risk assets and try to capitalize on those over the intermediate term. Next slide, please. So again, this just goes back to what I was talking about in terms of um, what the traditional portfolio looks like, whether you have long only equity, fixed income, corporate credit, real estate, private equity. While that looks diversified, really all of those kind of follow along with the business cycle, right? They respond to changes in credit conditions um, 
or credit contraction or credit expansion by central banks throughout the business cycle. And so when you boil everything down to what they truly are, short convexity or long convexity, you end up having a portfolio that's very uh, short convexity. And so really just uh, discretionary global macro and trend following also falls into this bucket um, is really a true diversifier in that, you know, when you see sort of these sudden trends unfold and a portfolio, maybe, you know, say like in 2022, we had very strong trends, you know, higher in interest rates, lower in equity prices, higher in the U.S. dollar. And that's the type of environment where a global macro strategy can take advantage of where you know you look at say your 60 40 portfolio that looks diversified and that got absolutely destroyed last year and so that was a perfect representation of this short convexity versus long convexity next slide please so unprecedented right so this is kind of the third main topic i want to talk about here and why i think global macro is so important is because since really the COVID crisis, we've heard a, you know this this term unprecedented over and over again, and the simple definition is without previous instance. You know we've never known it before or experienced it before, but you still still hear a lot of you know equity or market strategists, whether they're on TV or what what have you at banks, they'll still give you a firm prediction of where they think the ten year yield will end up at the end of this year. So you know if if this is truly unprecedented, as everyone says. You know, that's one of the reasons why we really try to avoid forecasts, because we don't believe that it really creates any value. And so what I want to do on the next couple of slides is just share some of the unprecedented things that we've seen um, in recent history. <clears throat> so, you know, in response to the COVID crisis, the U.S. Federal Reserve added more to its balance sheet in one year than did throughout the entire post-global financial crisis recovery. You know, mind you, that was basically 2008 to 2015. So th that was pretty unprecedented in terms of liquidity by a central bank. Next slide. Uh, the, again, this is another way of showing the amount of money sloshing around the system. We had the largest year-over-year -year jump in uh, M2 money supply in all recorded history. But now we're seeing the, the largest contraction in recorded history and this has all happened within a two-year span. Again, these wild swings are really, truly unprecedented. And so trying to have a, a strong forecast is extremely difficult. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Again, and this is another representation of what we talked about in terms of the 60-40 portfolio and why sort of this unprecedented performance can create true um, challenges for your traditional portfolio allocations, right? Last year was the worst year on record for the traditional 60-40 portfolio. Next slide, please. Well, the thing about unprecedented, right, is that with this heightened uncertainty comes a wide dispersion in potential outcomes. And so the next few slides, I just want to show where sort of the consensus is on different forecasts for the end of this year. So we see anywhere from negative 2% to, oh, sorry, it's hidden on my screen here, <clears throat> over 3%. That's a pretty wide dispersion in terms of where the economy is going to end up this year. And if you're right, maybe you have your asset allocation correct, but there's a lot of room for error in that, you know, in that dispersion of outcomes. Next slide, please. Same thing with the 10-year yield in the U.S., anywhere from really 6% to 2.5%. If we end up at 6%, your asset allocation is going to be vastly different than if we end up at 2.5%. So again, there's it's it's really difficult to wrap our heads around what where we're going to be. Um, and again, having those forecasts is just, it's, it's difficult to operate with. Next slide. Same thing with the S&P 500. I mean, this kind of says it all, 4,600 to 3,700. I mean... Well, if, if you're right on one of those extremes, that could be great for you. Um, but what if we end up somewhere in between? What if we end up around 4,100 or 4,000? You know, that's that doesn't do anything for your portfolio, right? I mean, that's, again, that's sort of your quintessential, um, you know, accepting small returns for a heck of a lot of tail risk, right? Next slide. <laughs> So what I want to do now is, is show how we use those four pillars that we talked about in practice. 
And so, as I mentioned before, um, you know, we our strategy is a, is a, is tries to be a diversifier to, you know, what is in most of the rest of your portfolio. Short convexity strategies. Now that said, we're not your typical long volatility strategy where we're just buying put options for for you know a tail event um, in the S and P five hundred because those can be really costly, right? You're just constantly losing money buying those options as they expire. Um, we do trade all asset classes, and why we think that's so important is because, you know, if we if we don't think that there's a lot of opportunity, say in in the S and P five hundred or, you know, say uh, over in China in equities, we don't feel a need to allocate capital there. We're going to go to where we see those really attractive risk reward opportunities, and where we think we could see the biggest bang for our buck. And so what we're trying to do, again, is we're trying to identify those short and intermediate term dislocations from the fundamental drivers, use extremes and in investor sentiment, look for compressed volatility. So compressed volatility is generally a sign that investors are disinterested or not paying attention, right? The movements are basically very small. We're trying to identify those supportive long-term structural trends, and then any potential catalysts that could sort of spur that sudden um, realization from investors that, oh no, we need to reposition our portfolio. Because it's really that repositioning of the portfolio as everyone does it, if they're positioned the same way, that creates those really sustainable trends over the, over the medium term. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> if we use the four pillars in practice, right, we, we start with say the fundamentals. Now, this is the inventory to sales ratio here in the United States. And if we look at this, we can see that it's at the highest level outside of the COVID crisis since the global financial crisis. Now, that by itself, you know, to give us an idea of what that means for both growth and inflation, is that should put downward pressure in the future on both growth and inflation, right? Companies have way too much inventory. And so they're going to do less ordering for new products. So that's less future growth of creating new products. So that's lower growth. But where it also puts downward pressure on prices is companies need to unload that excess inventory because sales aren't keeping up. And so what tends to happen, and we've seen, we've heard a lot of this from consumer oriented businesses here in the United States, whether it's Home Depot or Target or Restoration Hardware, um, they're talking about severe markdowns and that's part of unloading that inventory. And so as they mark down prices or create these additional sales, Again, that's going to put downward pressure on prices. So that's part of the fundamental look, right? And if we go to the next next slide here, we can also look at the trends and price pressure. So we see that price presser, pressures for businesses, right? Their input costs, whether it's oil or plastic, whatever it might be, those are falling very quickly, down to 2.6%. Now, businesses tend to pass those on to consumers as well. And that's why those two series tend to be so strongly correlated. So this is another example of why we would expect inflation here in the United States to fall fairly rapidly over the next several months. Next slide, please. Now, it's not just the United States, right? One of the things that we do is we also look at what's going on, going on around the world. Again, we're global macro because we're in such an interconnected world, you know, in terms of trade that you can get very interesting signs from other countries. So there's countries like Singapore, South Korea, even Sweden that are very export oriented. And so when you see a severe slowdown in their exports, even Germany, right, they're a manufacturing or industrial powerhouse, uh, it can give you signs for what might be going on in the rest of the world. And so we can see with Singapore, this is a perfect example that uh, there's a severe slowdown right around the Euro crisis in 2013. Again, in 2015, 2016, and really the only reason that rebounded was because China made a shock devaluation and then issued a $1 trillion in fiscal stimulus. We saw a similar collapse in their exports back in COVID, and now we see another severe collapse today. Now, the interesting part is this morning, I got another data point that I didn't have time to put into this presentation, but I mentioned Sweden is another export-oriented country. And their manufacturing PMI just collapsed to its second lowest point on record. Um, I'm sorry, the, the lowest point outside of COVID in the global financial crisis on record. So again, these are very depressed readings from other areas of the world that most, say, U.S. investors don't pay attention to. 
So again, this is just another sort of tidbit or, or hint that the economy may not be as strong as people currently think. Next slide, please. So we have fundamental data, right? The hard data that we're getting from governments around the world. But then we can also look at business surveys, right? These tend to be your leading indicators of where the cycle is heading. And so this is the perfect example of how bond yields tend to be correlated with uh, business surveys, right? Because as businesses become more optimistic, the economy is expanding and bond yields rise. Investors don't need those safe haven assets. They want riskier assets. And so what we see here is, you know, back in 2017, 2018, there was a divergence. Again, we talk about those short-term divergences. It was eventually resolved, right? As the market woke up to that. They followed together each other lower in 2019 and 2020. And then again, there's a big divergence in 2020 and 2021, and then bond, then bond yields eventually caught up. But now we see a very significant dislocation um, between the business outlook and uh, bond yields. And so as you can see, we're starting to come together with a picture here, right? We don't have to have a specific forecast on where inflation is going to settle. We kind of have an idea where we think the trend, overall trend and growth and inflation is going to be um, over the next several months. That's lower. Now we're looking at some survey data, some soft data, and that's also confirming this view that inflation and growth should be falling over the months ahead. And so we can start to get an idea of where we think asset prices are going to move, because that's what's most important, right, is where asset prices are going to go. Next slide, please. Here's another one. So this is another sort of nugget that gives us you know, a strong belief that inflation will fall over the months ahead. And this is the dollar versus oil. Now we've inverted the dollar here so you can see the correlation. But what this shows is that the dollar, um, the, the inverse of the dollar, as the dollar rises, oil tends to fall. And really, there's there's two reasons for that. One is oil is priced in dollars. But the other reason is if you think about a lot of emerging markets or importers of oil, oil is priced in US dollars. And so as a if you have a situation where the dollar is rising and oil is rising, like we saw here in 2022, that creates extreme um, stress on a lot of economies because not only are you having to pay the higher price of oil, but now your currency is devalued against the dollar. So it's not just the higher price of oil, but it's the higher price of the currency as well. And so this is a chart that we actually look at. And this, you know, one of our views since really um, late last year, I went on um, Real Vision, if any of you have heard of that. And I gave sort of our, our outlook for 2023. And one of our strong views is that oil would likely come over under significant pressure throughout 2023 as the economy and inflation starts to slow. So that's another that, you know, that should help push um, inflation lower if oil prices continue to fall. Next slide, please. So now that we've covered the fundamentals, right, the hard data that we see from governments, we've covered some of the, um, you know, uh, survey data leading in, um, indicators that we follow. But now this is where I like to talk about, you know, in terms of that price can be a liar. Right. So if if a technician, pure technician were to look at these charts, they would say, OK, well, you know, if you look back at late 2017, it looks like bond yields are falling. So a technician would say, well, bond yields are starting to fall. Well, if we look at other areas of the market where assets should be correlated, then we can actually find these instances where price can be a liar. So the copper gold ratio tends to be correlated with things like the manufacturing PMI. It follows the business cycle, right? As the economy is, is becoming stronger, then copper is in more demand because the economy is expanding, while investors want less safe, safe haven assets like gold. And so that ratio rises. And so we saw another dislocation in 2017 where the economy, according to copper gold, was doing much better and yields eventually caught up. And so we saw that again in 2021. It looks very similar to that manufacturing PMI. Well, today, similar to the, the collapse in the manufacturing PMI versus yields, we see another big dislocation. So again, that's another sort of technical analysis. It's called cross-asset analysis that gives us another hint that, okay, we're really starting to see the picture come together in multiple facets that say maybe bond yields should be a lot lower. Next slide, please. 
This is another one, same exact picture. Another cyclical sector like banks versus defensive sector like utilities. Same exact picture that we were just talking about where another major dislocation, okay? It's not just one way of looking at these cross asset. What, what we've found over time is there's a lot of different representations of these and it can give you a very good sense, again, of when you might see an instance where price might be a liar. So again, another little nugget or hint that yields might be set to fall. Next slide, please. And then there's positioning. Right, And why do we think that this could be a potentially really big opportunity? Well, we can see by the speculator positioning that investors are already massively short, right? They're already betting on significantly higher yields. So yes, yields could still go higher, but the big surprise would actually come from a fall in bond yields. And again, we're trying to find those opportunities where investors have to suddenly reposition their portfolios. And so if investors suddenly come around to this realization that maybe inflation and growth are falling pretty quickly, excuse me, then that could create a very strong trend of yields going lower, bond prices higher, um, as speculators try to cover their short position. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, so that's the U.S. with with yields, but now I want to touch on on Europe. Um, I know I'm kind of running a little out of time here, but we'll we'll try to get through these quickly. Um, Europe. This time we're going to start with positioning. Right, this is speculator positioning in the euro. Um, beginning of this year, everyone was extremely excited about the euro because inflation was very strong. The ECB was going to continue to raise interest rates, while the Federal Reserve was going to slow and pause, possibly cut rates. And there was this argument about a decoupling of the economies where the U.S. economy would slow, but Europe would remain strong because of the reopening over in China. So we see investors are already fully on board, almost record long positioning in the euro. Next slide. But what this shows is that actually the data in Europe, so these are the relative surprise indices. So the, the surprise index is the actual data versus expectations. And so what the blue line shows is that the surprise index for Europe versus the surprise index for the United States, and that compares against the euro versus the, the US dollar. And so what this shows is that the European data has been surprisingly weak against expectations throughout all of 2023, far weaker than here in the United States. And so based off of this correlation, which um, we believe should still hold, then investors may be very wrongly positioned being significantly long the euro on this belief of a decoupling with the United States. Next slide. Again, so we started with kind of the, the, the sentiment and the positioning and the expectations, um, but, this, but now we're moving into more of the hard fundamental data, right? So as I mentioned, Germany is a very industrial manufacturing oriented economy. You think of all the cars that they manufacture, um, steel and different industrial goods. Well, this shows that their industrial manufacturing orders to outside the euro area, so China, United States, <clears throat> India, whatever it might be, has been absolutely collapsing. Yet the DAX index, you know, the German uh, stock index, is right around an all-time high. So again, this this is one of the reasons we personally have been bearish on both the euro and um, the the German DAX index. Um, for the past several weeks is because we start to see this start to come together, very similar to the 10-year yield here in the United States, where there's severe dislocations and there's a very strong consensus, um, and that investors start to unwind those could create very powerful moves. Next slide, please. And this is another one. Again, this is shows, the similar to the manufacturing PMI, this is another survey that's run in, in Europe called the ZEW Eurozone Expectation of Economic Growth. And this just shows how that tends to lead the performance of the iShares MSCI Germany ETF here that's listed here in the United States. Again, we see a very strong downward move in expectation of economic growth, and we expect the German ETF to follow as well. Next slide. And this just, again, this shows how things look on a global basis, right? So we talked about Europe, we talked about United States, we talked about Singapore, talked about Sweden, but this just gives you, again, this is, if you remember that relative surprise index I showed with the euro, uh, with the euro, this shows across the major economies. So the U.S. their surprise index is rolling over, right? It has a little bounce recently, but it's rolling over. Europe has rolled over big time and is in deep negative territory. 
China has rolled over big time as well, you know, after all the reopening hopes. Same thing with Japan, big rollover, negative territory, and broader emerging markets are rolling over along with China as well. So even though there's there's improved expectations of the economy globally, what this shows is that actual data has been disappointing uh, quite significantly. Next slide, please. And then the last thing is liquidity. So as Rajiv mentioned, yes, the debt ceiling seems to be resolved here in the United States. And what I think investors need to be on the lookout for, so we have this fundamental um, concerns about the economy and inflation. But what I want to show here is why that the re resolution of the debt ceiling could actually be a major risk to markets in terms of liquidity. And so what we see here, this is the, the Fed's balance sheet and the Treasury general account. So the Treasury general account is just sort of the piggy bank for the U.S. Treasury. And what they've been doing since um, the since really most of the past year is depleting that Treasury general account, right? They've been spending money. And that's generally supportive of risk assets because what that does is they're making cash payments out to investors. And so that's more capital they can put to work and, and financial assets. And so what this shows is that really, as the Fed's been doing quantitative tightening, right, their balance sheet's been shrinking, the Treasury general account has also been shrinking. So that's actually been offsetting a lot of the liquidity withdrawal the Fed's been trying to do. So if we go to the next page, I want to explain why this is such a major risk um, to markets um, over the next couple of months. Next slide, please. So this shows what happens when the Treasury general account actually is rebuilt. So if we look at 2015, 2018, 2020, um, even earlier in 2022, when the Treasury general account issues its bonds to you know, rebuild their piggy bank, right? they're issuing bonds and they're taking capital from investors. right? So that's taking capital out of the market. Now that's going on while the Federal Reserve is also running their quantitative tightening. So that's a double impact of withdrawing uh, liquidity out of the market. Now, as we can see, 2015, 2018, um, those are both instances where the with the rebuild of the TGA was a major risk off for, for asset prices. 2020, that was offset a bit because the Federal Reserve all of a sudden came you know, guns blazing with their quantitative easing. But if we look at early 2022, remember, the Fed hadn't even raised interest rates or ended QE until March of 2022. And so we see that the rebuild of the TGA in early 2022 is actually what sparked the initial sell-off in risk assets. And so as we see this resolution of the debt ceiling, we could be looking at a major uh, liquidity event for the market. And it's why I think you know investors really need to be cautious, um, especially in the short term here on risk assets. Next slide. And this is just another slide to show, you know, liquidity. Um, this is the spread between the market-based interest rate, say the two-year versus the federal funds rate. And what we see here is if you look back at 1998, 2000, 2007, 2008, 2020, and then again today, whenever this becomes inverted, right, or, or negative, the black line, what this says is the market believes the Federal Reserve has interest rates too high, right? The Federal Reserve is making a mistake on having too tight of liquidity. And that's generally when things tend to break, right? If we think back 1998, there was an Asian financial crisis and the uh, collapse of long-term capital management. 2000 was obviously the dot-com bubble. 2008, global financial crisis. Um, and then e even before COVID, that was negative in 2019. And what a lot of investors don't remember is the economy was slowing in 2019. And the Federal Reserve is actually already cutting interest rates and running QE prior to COVID crisis. So it wasn't just COVID that created, you know, the issues for risk assets. Uh, COVID was just kind of like an accelerant um, that made things even worse. And so we, we see something very similar today. Um, you know, what investors were expecting, the strong consensus were equities are going to be weak in the first half with a strong rebound in the second half. And actually, at the beginning of this year, we took the opposite view. We thought investors were so negative to begin the year that we could see a relief rally in equity assets. Um, and we've seen that so far. And we actually think that the pain for risk assets will be in the second half of this year, as a lot of these fundamental drivers of falling growth, falling inflation, tightening liquidity will be realized. Um, a weak U.S. dollar. The dollar is flat to slightly higher. We we are actually, we turned very bullish on the dollar back in April, um, continue to hold that view. We're short, you know, several currencies like uh, the Australian dollar, the uh, the euro, um, higher bond yields. Bond yields are flat to slightly uh, lower. 
right? So we 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 like that continued call on falling bond yields against the consensus. Europe and emerging market outperformance. Emerging markets is uh you know pretty weak uh, aside from a few um you know tech and semi related um areas. There was hatred for technology that's been very strong. Um, and then resilient inflation boosts commodities. You know, we had the view that infl um, inflation would fall quickly. And so we've been bearish on things like copper and oil, um, you know, more so tied with the business cycle. And so, you know, just knowing where the consensus is will usually give you a very good idea to where to look for where so those sudden repricings can occur. Thank you, Mike. Uh, really a great conversation. I, I love the, you know, the logic and the analysis. Let me start off with something which is, a, you know, a simple question, perhaps, but I wanted your point of view. So uh, the liquidity drives everything is a thesis quite a few economists hold uh, at this point in time, quite a few macro strategists hold. And that sort of says that pretty much every asset's uh, performance uh, correlates to liquidity, right? Which essentially means that, you know, the correlation between ratios and assets is one, right? You know, that's effectively what we're saying. So the question I have for you is obviously when we are doing all these ratios, right? And if everything is sort of going to correlate to one because liquidity is that big wave that's sort of coming in, what is the, is there too much of logic and sense in looking at these ratios or shall we just look at liquidity and just say, okay, this is what we need to do and just position ourselves across assets. You know, it makes life simpler, doesn't it? I mean, uh, uh, it sounds like a slightly stupid question, but I, I would sort of want to get your point of view on that. It does. Um, but where I, I would say we differ on that view is that these cross asset relationships tend to reveal themselves even earlier than liquidity. Um, and so, you know, for example, um, we saw a rollover in, say, the uh, copper gold ratio in, say, mid 2018. And so, what that told us, yes, that was, you know, yes, there was, um, there was a, the Fed was raising interest rates and they were running quantitative tightening at the time. Um, but remember, I mean, we're looking at the reason why we look at the ratios is because um, if if everything were purely driven off of liquidity, then copper and gold should move together up and down, up and down. But really, what we you know what we see is that you know, there's a preference for, for cyclicals or defensive, right? At, investors are rotating their, their preferences between those two. And so what we actually saw in um, late 2018, and it's actually what had us extremely, um, at the time, bearish on risk assets. We were extremely bullish bonds in late 2018, um, was that rollover in the copper gold ratio was one of the factors and leading indicators were rolling over as well. And that actually preceded the turn in liquidity from the Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. And so the Federal Reserve sort of hiked interest rates after all that fallout. And so what you'll see is, again, because these assets, even though the broad level of asset prices should, you know, are driven by liquidity, um, you'll still see differences in the overall performance of them. Um, and it's that differences in performance that really tells the story, I think, um, in terms of the economy. And so you know, we saw the rollover, or, you know, even before, it, the thing is, is even though we believe that liquidity is the major driver, um, we do believe that price for a lot of assets can be a liar. You know, for example, I mean, bonds in, you know, early 2022, I mean, two-year yields were almost zero still. And so, again, if you're looking for that sort of that major risk reward, the attractive five to one, I mean, you could have been shorting bonds in the United States saying, you know, what's my downside if they go to zero? Um, whereas if that copper gold ratio is correct, if the surge in money supply was correct in predicting inflation, um, there was a massive risk reward difference there. Um, and so a lot of these ratios tend to lead um, what we actually see the response from policymakers, because policymakers, you know, they're looking at the lagging economic data. They're not looking at market-based pricing. Um, and so they react to what we're seeing months in, in advance. Thank you. The next question really has to do with the philosophy in a down market, right? So, you know, it's incredibly difficult to make money in a market that's going down very simply because the instinctive viewpoint of every asset is to go up, right? You know, so you're sort of bucking the trend there. And that's the reason why everybody sort of gets burnt. You know, it's happened to a lot of us, it's happened to me for sure. 
So what is it, you know, what is it that makes a difference in investing in these kinds of circumstances? Is it uh, the Howard's Marks uh, viewpoint, uh, you only do four trades in 10 years or, uh, or a few trades in a year kind of a thing, if I were to use that example? Is it, um, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, is it something else like, you know, a high skew and risk versus reward? So you never get into something unless you've got a five is to one. Uh, if I were to look at the Paul Tudor Jones quote that you had, what is it that makes a difference here, Mike? You know, why do you think you are successful in this uh, when compared to most people that sort of, you know, this is completely bucking the trend, right? So I would say the biggest differentiator is if we don't, if if the stars aren't aligning for us, you know, we don't have an, we don't feel a need to, to be invested long or short. Um, and so, you know, really what we're looking for and a lot of investors, especially individual investors, they feel a need to always be doing something, right? There's almost an addiction to the action, the the, the green and the red flashing on their screens. Um, but really, I mean, we could be sitting there for two months, three months doing nothing, and then something really presents itself. And we're not hesitant in really piling in our risk. Um, and that's that's really what we try to do is we try to stay very patient and then pile in when we see something really attractive. And so, you know, I think what makes us successful at what we do, um, again, is really that blending of the fundamental and the technical. Because the fundamentals, I mean, look, anyone can have a view on a market or an asset price, but the reality is until the rest of the market starts to appreciate your view, it's not gonna matter. And so prices can keep going up if you think they should go down. And so really we focus on what we call acceleration as part of our technicals. And we have a bunch of models that we've built. And so we'll have a view, um, you know, we'll form our fundamental view based off of, you know, kind of what I shared there. And then really we'll wait for our technical models to fire uh, to tell us when to act. And then we pile in a lot of risk for short periods of time. Um, and, you know, I think it's those timing models um, that, you know, it's not going to guarantee that we're always correct. That's that's certainly not the case, um, but it certainly helps with with putting the odds in our favor, because, again, we're what we're trying to do, that acceleration, like we like to call it, that tends to be a sign that investors are suddenly reassessing whatever view they had. And so, you know, we saw in the euro, I mean, we were pretty bearish on the euro <clears throat> for several, uh, for, for a couple of months, but we really didn't take any positions until um, I want to say like late April, like very late April. And then some of our models started to, to fire on the technicals and we really started to press those bets and, and add risk shorting the Euro. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's a perfect example of, you know, a lot of investors just think like, okay, I, I like Apple or whatever the company is. And they put a whole bunch of their portfolio into Apple. Well, what happens is, the fluctuations, right? Those short-term mean reversion fluctuations and, and emotion, that starts to fuel your emotions. And it makes you start doing things that you shouldn't. Whereas if you can understand those short-term fluctuations, um, you know, and it helps you trade, maybe you wait for a weakness to buy or, you know, whatever it might be, um, you know, and, and really focus on those sudden change moments. I think that's what really helps sets us apart. Hmm. Uh, the third question, and this is really intriguing. I love the slide that you had, the seesaw between the uh, ignorance and um, you know, you know, and uh, and the other part, right? So effectively, uh, you know, what was the other one that you said? Ignorance versus arrogance, 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 right? arrogance, arrogance ignorance. ignorance. Absolutely. Question is, uh, you know, most you know most traders would tend to believe that you choose one. Right? You either play technical or you play fundamental, right? You try and do a mix of this, you're going to end up with this pointing somewhere, this pointing somewhere, and you're going to get screwed in the market, right? That's sort of the you know traditional wisdom. So the question is, I mean, obviously you're saying you have to be in between, which by definition means you have to have a mix of fundamental and technical sort of driving your behavior. You did make a viewpoint about that in the last answer that you gave just now, but would you elaborate a bit more about how you think about this from a framework perspective, right? If you're sitting around making these investment choices, what would be the thought process you have between arrogance and ignorance in terms of you know technical versus uh, you know uh, uh, you know fundamental? Yeah, so you know what I shared in sort of that the case studies there is a perfect example of 
we certainly don't think that we're smarter than the rest of the market. And that's why we respect technicals so much. And, and we use technicals for the timing of our trades. You know, I think it's another legend, uh, Bruce Kovner had a quote that, you know, with trading without technicals or a price chart is similar to a doctor not even taking your temperature before telling you what's wrong with you, right? I mean, all doctors mm -hmm. take your temperature. So price chart is, is just taking your temperature. Um, so what I think is, you know, we certainly have our view on, you know, the different leading indicators, the survey data that lead um, the data. And, you know, if we think the central banks are, are incorrect or strategists are incorrect. Um, so that's, you know, certainly you have a view, right? And so whether, you know, but we don't, I wouldn't say we take that to a level of arrogance because we also know that there's millions of investors out there that know things and are seeing things that we don't see. Um, and that's why we use that cross asset analysis. So that's basically our, our check on our arrogance um, to say, what's the rest of the market saying? You know, we think this, but maybe, you know, the other asset classes, other traders are, are seeing, you know, something completely different where we could be wrong. Um, and so there are certainly times when, you know, we might have a view based off of fundamental data or whatever it might be. And the cross asset analysis just says, no, the market, the market, you know, tells you you're wrong. Um, and so it's kind of, it's, like I said, we really try to blend those with, and that's why I said, you know, we don't give forecasts. We kind of say where we think the trend in asset prices will go. Um, but then we use sort of, as I said early, at the very beginning, really all we're trying to do is observe what the market's telling us, right? We're just trying to sit with open ears, not tell the market what we think, but listen to what the market thinks. Um, and then find those opportunities where price might be a liar. Uh, great. A couple of last questions, really, Mike. One has to do with the fact that in the near term, all indicators, at, at least according to the presentation, are pointing downwards, right? You know, uh, the manufacturing indices are moving downward, the dollar is moving upward, crude oil is moving downward, commodities are moving downward, gold is moving upward. The, essentially everything, I mean, the yield curve indices uh, are inverted and all that jazz, right? So when does this view change? You know, so you obviously are going into a, you know, recessionary, you know, in the Goldilocks recession, you're going into the recession frame. When do you think this thing changes potentially? You know, when when does this thing bottom out? And, you know, I think they, the animal spirits have to come back at some point in time, otherwise humanity can't survive, right? You know, if I were to yeah. use something really profound or stupid, wow, you look at it. But when does this change? What What happens next? When do you think the situation reverses? So ultimately, um, our our view is that uh, the Federal Reserve is is making a policy mistake by continuing to raise interest rates while running quantitative tightening. Um, you know, because again, I, I mean, I, we don't give price levels of where we think things, but you know, we we always just like to sit around and, and do thought experiments, right? Just chat about what's going on. And so one of the thought experiments that we just recently had um, is say inflation falls to 3% here in the United States by the end of this year, right? I mean, the Fed forecasts three and a half percent. And again, we're not trying to say we're smarter than the Fed or anyone else, but we'll say, okay, say it falls to three, three and a half percent. If that happens, that probably means that the economy is slowing, continues to slow, right? Because that's what puts downward pressure on prices. And so in that scenario, do we think that the Federal Reserve will still maintain um, short-term interest rates at 5.25%? That's a pretty um, you know, positive real interest rate. Um, our view is that we don't think that they will, you know, if inflation falls to three and a half percent or 3%, um, they probably end up, you know, backing off, um, and, and possibly cutting interest rates now. And that's where it comes down to, um, your expression of your trades. And so, you know, one way to express that trade is to go along, say, um, the SOFR futures, you know, the short-term interest rate futures for like the end of this year. Well, the problem with that is they're already pricing in, um, an interest rate by the by December of this year, if I look of um, 4.8%. So they're already pricing in about 50 basis points um, of, of rate cuts for this year. 
So the risk reward there doesn't seem really attractive because that market already seems to you know be in line with our view. But where that might manifest itself, um, it really is, I think, more longer out on on the um, on the yield curve. Um, you know, we we like the idea of a steepening yield curve position. Um, you know, so that's that's one of our favorite ideas. You know, basically for that, you go long two year, short ten year. Um, you know, and just bet betting on the shape of the curve. Um, and so, you know, that's the, that's the other thing too, that I think, um, going back to, I know your, one of your past questions is, um, a lot of investors, you know, I think where you find your best opportunities is when you dig down the rabbit hole, right? When you, when you hear a, a headline or you see a situation start to unfold, always do, go down the rabbit hole and see all the different tentacles that it touches, because chances are you're going to find your best opportunities down those tentacles because, Markets are very, you know, I would say in the short term, markets are very efficient. Algos and, and, and quants, they've, they've done an excellent job of, you know, news events quickly being priced in to, to asset prices. But what, you know, that's very, you know, I would say level one, right? Apple beats earnings. Well, level one of that is Apple stock price goes up. But what does that mean? You know, okay, so that probably means that the suppliers are going to, have very strong earnings, right? And so you can kind of go down the tentacles and find out what the second order, what the third order effects are. And a lot of times what you'll see is it's those second and third order effects where, you know, the the, the immediate asset price reacts. And then you say, well, this thing should be reacting, you know, this way. It's not. And sometimes it almost makes you think like, wait, am I wrong? Um, but it's just the market takes time to get around to realizing that. And so you can often find really attractive opportunities at better prices when you go down those different tentacles to find the second and third order effects, um, um, excuse, excuse me, um, to, to express those trades and take advantage of it. Fabulous. I think uh, that was a great conversation, Mike. Um, you know, um, uh, we will put out the details for people to reach out to you uh, on the link when you're posting the, uh, you know, the videos. Thank you so much for the session. Really look forward to further such. Uh, and we should get you to India at some point in time in the near future. So, uh, you know, you're able to sort of give us this face-to-face uh, -face instead of doing it over Zoom. Thank you so much. Look forward to further such conversations. Cheers. Yes, thanks for having me. Bye-bye.